Hi, this is Susan Pick here, and, and I'm co-author of the longtime classic Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. And recently, in 2017, we were asked to write an update to the book, and we have some, we think, kind of groundbreaking new stuff. It's not completely new, but it's new to us, uh, vegan diets for dogs and cats. And we're excited about it and want to share with you why we're doing it and how to do it. This is the fourth edition. You can order it on Amazon. It's already, as it turns out, before it's even been released, the number one bestseller in pet food and nutrition in new releases. We're excited. <laughs> and we've long advocated a holistic approach. This time we're taking kind of a deeper look at what is holism, what is really holistic. It's something that regards all factors in the person or the animal, right? And it, it treats the whole patient when it's used for health. And in a larger sense, it must consider the well-being of all life because all life is wholly interconnected and interdependent. Like we couldn't be healthy if we didn't have a planet there that was healthy to support us, right? So here's what's new in the fourth edition. Uh, the first chapter that we've inserted now is what's happened to all our food. So it's not just about what's wrong with traditional pet food, with the 4D wastes and the rancid and moldy grains and, and the euthanized pets and the, you know, the collars and the, and the beaks and feathers and all that kind of stuff that's in that food. But what's in even fresh food today that's not really up to snuff? Well, first of all, there's been an historical decline in nutrients, particularly in conventionally grown foods, whether plant foods or animal foods. And that is due at the bottom of the food chain to soil degradation uh, from conventional farming, which has destroyed a lot of soil microbes that are necessary to help plants really properly assimilate minerals. Also, there's been too rapid growth from breeding of both plants and animals to grow too fast, you know, use of fertilizers, hormones, and so forth. And they don't have time to really assimilate all the minerals that they need, which can also help them make all the, the other nutrients. This is a good article from Mother Earth News that you can read more details about that and some of the scientists and studies behind it. So uh, another part of that, what's happened to all of our food, is there's been an increase in toxins and they're accumulating up the food chain. It turns out that about 88 to maybe as much as 99% of our chemical intake is coming from animal products. That means that vegans who don't eat any animal products have far less toxins in their tissues. For example, here's a, you know, a study that one to 2% maybe of the levels in vegans' tissues as from the general population. Of special concerns are heavy metals. They're extremely high when they've been tested in many pet foods. Particularly beware of mercury in seafood, arsenic in chicken, and lead in bones. There is some studies that have been done have shown as much as 120 times the reference dosage limit for humans proportionalized to body weight in mercury in dog food and 30 times the mercury levels in cat food. Now, um, cats you know, consume about 30 times more seafood than the average American per pound of body weight. And mercury tests indeed about five times higher in cat tissues. This is a possible problem to consider in thyroid conditions and kind of bad mouths and things like that. If you look at the symptoms for mercury poisoning, you can get an idea, like a lot of saliva and so on. All right, another con special concern today is glyphosate, uh, also known as Roundup. Uh, it's used as an herbicide widely in genetically modified crops. Uh, it, it kills the weeds, but not the target plant. And that's used especially in soy, corn, and canola in terms of the food crops. It turns out it's in most of us because we're all exposed to these conventional foods, especially when we eat out, even if we eat organic. It, they also accumulate, the, the glyphosate accumulates in livestock fed most of the GM soy and corn. And uh, we've been learning that it's been widely used for some time to dry out wheat, the non-organic kind, for quick uniform harvest. There are correlations between levels of glyphosate in gluten issues with gluten issues and the rise of celiac disease and leaky gut. And a German study has linked it with high levels of 
chronic disease. It's a pretty good correlation there. Um, back to this wheat thing, I mean, it's here's at the bottom here, you can see some, as of 2012, 99% of Durham wheat, 97% of spring wheat, 61 winter, has been treated with these kind of herbicides. And so, um, and a lot of it's been applied, you know, as a desiccant drying agent in the last 15 years. This may have a lot to do with the sensitivity to gluten a lot of people are having. Another new chapter is Loving the Earth and All Animals. This is Colleen Patrick Goodrow uh, snuggling with a cow. <laughs> She's, her life is devoted to helping other people understand their values and live by their values, compassion for all animals. And we would add to that for our whole Mother Earth. We see that from some of the things we've been learning that there are looming crises ahead and already happening for humanity and for planet Earth, and with that, major opportunities for positive cultural change. Let's go into that. According to only 97% of climate scientists, we will soon reach, if we haven't already, a dangerous tipping point of climate change. that will bring us increasing droughts, uh, more floods, rising ocean levels, especially coastal cities are at risk, mega storms, melting glacial waters impacting major Asian rivers and thus much of the world's population, creating millions of climate refugees and thus a, a lot of conflict as people try to, to migrate and, and other people don't want them in their countries, right? And loss of innocent lives. It turns out some people who investigated this, like in this World Watch report, say that as much as 51% of greenhouse gases may be from raising livestock. That's because they really produce a lot of methane in their digestive process, especially the grain-fed ones, which is most of them. And that's a very potent greenhouse gas. However, it can be cleared quickly from the atmosphere compared to CO2. That's a good news about that if we reduce our consumption of beef. That 51% figure is far more than all transportation combined. So you might drive your Prius or your electric car, and that's good, but you could do a lot more good by cutting out or cutting down your consumption, particularly of beef. Likewise, by 2025, not that far from now, we may lose the mighty Amazon, lungs of the earth, and also home to many, many species that are now going extinct. That's because we're clearing the Amazon, you know, at huge rates to create pasture and also feed crops for our livestock uh, in the first world, particularly, and in China. So that's not even particularly benefiting the people who live there. 91% of this destruction is for this animal agriculture. And then similarly, we have a big issue with the ocean coming up. If we keep fishing at the rate we are, just trillions of, you know, of fish every, every year, um, the oceans will be empty of fish, of anything decent, you know, other than maybe some jellyfish by 2048. And uh, you can hear more about that from Richard Oppenlander in the, the wonderful film Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret, where we have gotten a lot of this information and really first got turned on to the value ecological value, particularly of a vegan diet. Half the catch in the ocean, did you know this, goes to livestock and fish farms. And, um, you know, this is fed even to animals that really are considered herbivores, you know, like cows and, you know, and turkeys, whatever. So they, and as well, along with carcasses of <laughs> euthanized pets and roadkill and, and whatever they can get, you know, they're just dumping everything into livestock feed. And the fish farms that, you know, are really pretty gross places with the, you know, where they're feeding them the, the seafood fish, and that's not really so efficient, is it? And uh, they're pretty filthy, and they have a lot of parasites, a lot of disease, and they use a lot of drugs for that. Richard Oppenlander says, really, there is no such thing as sustainable seafood, and you hear that also from some of the ocean protection organizations. The marine stewardship... Step, ship Council and other kinds of sustainable seafood labels, in, in essence, really are bought and paid for. On page 118 of the, of the follow-up book, Cowspiracy, the Sustainability Secret, you can see how, you know, really they've never turned down anybody that applies, they just pay them enough money. 
So don't, you know, necessarily think that that there might be, you know, methods that are better for fishing, but it's, it's, it's all overfished at this point. Likewise, by 2050, mid-century or so, we might wipe out half of all species on Earth today, particularly because of the destruction of the forests and the oceans. Uh, this is an ocean destruction, an example of, you know, bleached out dead coral reefs. This is called, going to cause the ma greatest mass extinction since the dinosaurs, the sixth great extinction. And it impacts us too, not just um, because we might have less oxygen because, you know, the the Amazon and the oceans are great producers of oxygen, but also less water. Uh, this is almost in Reservoir. We used to live near there, and it used to be always pretty much full. And now, you know, with the California droughts, it's been really quite low. By 2050, two-thirds of humanity will likely be short of fresh water. Not good. A third of global aquifers are already depleted, according to a UN report. And uh, the southern Great Plains some people are saying could go dry by 2030. The Great Ogala, Ogallala Aquifer beneath the Great Plains, our breadbasket, uh, is at risk because we're using it up far faster than it replenishes from rainfall. These red areas are particularly at risk. That's not so much because we're thirsty, but because most U.S. water <laughs> goes to animal agriculture. It can take like a hundred times more water to produce a gram of animal protein versus plant protein. A single burger can take like 600 gallons of water, a quarter pounder, say. Here's 600 gallons of water approximately. We put in some rain tanks a few years ago and we realized actually the best way to save water is just to change our diet. This concerns us personally, and, and I think all of us who have children, grandchildren, within 60 years, um, a lot of these are things that will be gone, and within 60 years, the world's topsoils could be gone, according to this article in the Scientific American. And by 2050, we may have just a quarter of the land per person we had in 1960. That's a very scary thing. This is mostly because we're using all these really uh, chemical-heavy farming techniques, deforestation causing erosion, global warming, and all that. I mean, if we were to really conserve our soil and use careful, you know, organic techniques and, and not trample all over the soil and, you know, erode it and break it down, we could maybe save it, you know, but we need to be very careful about how much we use. We're going to have a situation where our, our kids are going to be suffering the same as kids already are suffering around the world uh, due to lack of food security. One of the ways, again, is to cut down our use of meat. The standard American diet, you know, takes far more than a vegan or even a vegetarian diet. 18 times the land compared to a vegan diet. Another subject which often is overlooked, I think, is fossil fuels. We, we depend upon them for everything, for farming and, you know, fertilizers, actually, too, yeah, as well as the machinery. Refrigeration, cooking, transportation, construction, communications, heating and cooling our houses and businesses. The medicines and plastics and consumer goods that we make that are manufactured from the, the feedstock. We need to conserve that feedstock for material goods uh, rather than use it all up for energy when we could you know, just be reducing our fossil fuel use for transportation and, and, and uh, for for animal agriculture and you know we could use solar and all that more so we need to do this or it's going to be lost and go down and that's coming sooner or later but we there's ways we can transition to that new economy and we need to do it now so eating meat for a year actually burns about enough fuel to if you to, you could have driven for 16,000 miles instead you know and and that's like you know a good part of the way around the world right <laughs> dragging your meat with you we're not dragging it. So diets matter, both for us and the diets also of our dogs and cats. The good news, though, is that you can save a tremendous amount. Every day you eat vegan instead of an, a standard omni kind of diet, you will save the planet 1,100 gallons of water on average, 30 square feet of rainforest, 45 pounds of grain, 
20 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalents, enough fuel to drive almost 46 miles, and an animal's life, which means a heck of a lot to them. So for details, I really recommend that you watch this great film, Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret, that's now on Netflix, or read their book by the same name, and please share it with your family and friends. All right, let's look at the impact ecologically of our dog and cats diets. Our first example. Okay, let's say we have a 70 pound dog and she's now going to eat vegan, as we recommend in our new edition, instead of the meat and mostly grain diet we had in our previous editions. I'm gonna compare that, that diet in our previous editions in its proportions of, of grains and meat kind of to the standard American diet. Well, Americans eat an average of about 22, 13 calories uh, between men and women's averaged per person a day. A 70 pound normally active dog needs about 1472 calories according to an online calculator. So that dog's eating about two thirds the calories of what an average American eats. So I'm gonna figure their footprint eating that mixed diet is about two thirds ours is. So say, so a vegan diet will save two thirds what you would save, which is every day about 733 gallons of water your dog would save, 20 square feet of rainforest, 30 pounds of grain, 13 pounds of carbon dioxide release, Ooh. enough fuel to drive 30 miles, and Two-thirds of an animal? Oh well, <laughs> you get the idea. Now let's use a second example. What if your dog was had been eating the raw diet, or in other words, meat, with a little bit of veggies, which are not significant calories, and um, instead with, shifted to a vegan diet? What would she save the world now? Or put it the other way, what would she cost the world by eating the raw diet instead of a vegan diet that can sustain her health fully. Well, okay, we figured that the normally active dog has about 1472 calories in her diet a day. Turns out 18 ounces of mixed beef cuts is about 1500 calories. So I'm gonna say that's about, you know, maybe about 18 ounces of meat a day. That is, turns out to be about twice what the average American eats every day, nine ounces. So, Let's just say if she eats vegan instead of raw, she's going to save about twice what a person saves. So therefore, 2,200 gallons of water. Wow! <laughs> 60 square feet of rainforest, 90 pounds of grain, 40 pounds of CO2 release, and enough fuel to drive 91 miles. That's like from, we live in Sedona, you know, go drive, driving to Phoenix kind of and two animals' lives. Okay, let's multiply that dog's life by, say, 11 years. Probably could live longer on a vegan diet. And over that life, though, her, the dietary difference between the vegan and the raw diet is like 8.8 .8 million gallons of water, five and a half acres of rainforest, which is kind of like uh, much of our neighborhood, 17 to 18 lots, which you know, we would, in America, would have valued about $2 million. Uh, 180 tons of grain, that's one, that pallet has one ton of grain ready to ship. So I'll give you a visual on that. There it is, her lifetime on a raw versus vegan diet. Takes that much more. And enough fuel is saved to drive around the earth 15 times during her lifetime. Whoa. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And 8,000, excuse me, 8,000 sentient beings. That's a lot of animals. And if we could look in each one of their eyes, would we make this choice, really? Could we kill 8,000 animals ourselves? Okay, now let's take a scale it up a little bit more. Plant nation versus raw nation. There's a lot of dogs here in the United States, about 73 million. What if everyone fed this ancestral diet, so-called, of mostly raw meat? Well, okay, 
I'm just going to make a stab at it. Let's say first we we have the daily impact of the 70 pound dog. Since a lot of dogs are smaller, that may not be quite accurate, but you're going to get the idea. Now we take that and we multiply it by 73 million. So by that way of doing it, a raw diet would use this much more than a vegan diet every day if all the United States dogs went to the widely recommended raw meat diet. 80.3 billion gallons of water every day, enough for the household needs of 3.6 billion Asians at the level they use it. 50,000 acres of forest, which is like killing all the animals and plants of three original Manhattan islands every day. 1.6 billion tons of grain, which would be enough to feed 3.2 billion humans, like half the world. Uh, 73,000 tons of CO2, which I'm sure is a huge amount of impact on climate change. Enough fuel to drive around the world 23,000 times. And the lives of 73 million animals, which for them is like 10 holocausts every single day if we were to feed all U.S. dogs a raw diet. In 11 years, let's say this amount would, would unnecessarily destroy 192 some million acres of rainforest, which is like most of Arizona, far more than Hawaii with all its beautiful tropical forests. And let's take look at it another way. Humanity now uses the resources of about one and a half Earths. How do we do that? Well, it's sort of like we, we, we steal it and we're not looking to the future. Our children and all life is going to pay for this pretty darn soon. So what if, um, the, you know, much of the developing world would like to live like Americans. And so what if everybody did? Then how much would we use? Well, if people ate like we do, and, and used the consumer goods and all that, it would take like some three Earths. Now, people have made estimates as to what would happen if everyone ate the meat-heavy, low-carb, paleo, you know, no grain-free, etc. diets that are so popular today. What would that be like? What do you think? Estimates, 10 Earths. Uh, it's just so destructive. It's so impossible. We need to change something, clearly. Ooh, is that a planet on the barbecue? <laughs> well, the bottom line here, okay, is that the amount of meat that we and our pets eat is just simply no longer sustainable. There's too many of us, not enough earth. That means it has to come to an end, whether that's sooner or later. This isn't our idea. This is just kind of the facts speaking for themselves. You know, do the homework yourself if you don't believe it. If it's sooner, that would be better for everyone, for nature, for we'd have more resources, better health, actually. In most cases, abundance, more peace, more justice, and ultimately more love in the world because it's a much more peaceful and, and kind diet. Or later, if we wait till the last minute, it will be apocalyptic for many, perhaps all. You know, we will have no choice. There won't be food. There'll be great conflict, hunger, and suffering, mass destruction of nature and culture, um, conflict and all that. So the last dis ditch efforts are likely to be too little and too late at that point. So why don't we get started now? So what would be sustainable? Let's say you want to feed your dog a little bit of meat or your cat, okay, or yourself. <laughs> this is what food expert Michael Paul on estimates estimates it is a sustainable amount of meat per person, like, you know, given the amount of land and resources well that we have and the number of people. He says about two ounces a week. Just, you know, it's kind of off the top of his head, but he's a pretty informed person. Okay, well, let's just go with that. Let's say a 70-pound dog on raw meat diet eats about 18 ounces of meat a day. That means they're eating 126 ounces a week. And that is 63 times what Michael Pollan is estimating to be sustainable for us. Can we do that? I don't think so. Maybe you could feed your dog half a burger on Sundays. <laughs> now, kind of incalculable, ultimately, and very much out of sight, is the animal and human suffering 
also involved in our food choices. As Will Tuttle, a vegan activist and author of World Peace Diet, says, people who kill and torture others without remorse appall us. We lock them up as sociopaths and psychopaths. Yet we, as he means like by what we buy, torture and kill animals who feel pain and fear just as we do. And though we try to ignore and discount their suffering at our hands, we know deep down that it's unnecessary, horrifying, and immoral. It's like we have kind of a blind spot. We don't really want to see this. But it's important to see the truth, isn't it? And today in the United States, just today, whatever day this is, you're looking at this, some 30 million chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, sheep, and rabbits, land animals, will be killed for our food preferences, most of them needless. I'll grant you that maybe some cats, you know, need some meat. Nearly all will have spent their whole lives out of sight and out of mind in intense industrial farm conditions, especially those small animals. Also today in the U.S., 45 million marine animals will be killed for us and our pets without mercy, and they have been proven to have feelings and central nervous systems. They suffer pain just as much as we do. Plus, countless wildlife who have been displaced by farmlands, feed crops, and ranching, all that inefficient use of land, or killed by predator control programs, which are done by our government at our expense, on behalf of ranchers who are leasing public lands for cheap. They kill coyotes, bears, cougars, wolves, you know, anything that's competing uh, to maybe threaten the cattle and sheep. Now to us, these are just numbers. But to these animals, this is all they know. This is their life. Uh, veal calves, for example, are part and part of dairy products. We didn't fully understand that as when we were vegetarians mostly for a long time. So even on organic farms, I mean, this is a part and parcel of it. They live forlorn lives of isolation, immobility, and malnutrition. I mean, some are, you know, a little bit more humanely raised than others, but many of this is what we see right in front of you is typical. And they're ripped away from their mothers, you know, just shortly after birth. The cows shed tears, and their, the mother grieves for them for weeks or even years. And this is done every year, essentially. They have to be impregnated forcibly, and then um, to have a calf so she will produce milk. And not for her baby, but for us, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're like the only species that t takes milk from another species in that way, pretty much. And after weaning... Also, tail dockings, dehorning, castrations, beak trims are all routinely done on, on farming animals without anesthesia, even on organic farms. And uh, for pigs, that sausage, the ham, that pork, that bacon. Well, bars force sows to lie for weeks in farrowing crates to nurse their piglets before they're reimpregnated and put back in the gestation crate. They're just seen as reproduction machines. I can't imagine being forced to lie down like that all the time, never move, lie in your own feces and urine. That's horrible. I think that's completely unacceptable. Especially, you know, pigs are of geek or greater intelligence than dogs. You know, they're, they're not, you know, like machines. They're beings, aren't they? Likewise, did you know that chickens, turkey, ducks, you know, they're exempt from humane slaughter laws, um, on purpose. Though, although they put them through an electric treatment to kind of shock them, they don't all get you know, uh, stunned by that. And many of them are scalded alive in the next step of the slaughtering process when they take their feathers off. In any case, during their lives, even the free range ones are all just utterly crammed into places. Yeah, you might have a very small percentage raised locally by your, your backyard farmer or whatever. But most of them are essentially stuffed by the thousands into cages, into barns, and whatever. With backyard layer chickens, did you know that they, the chickens generally almost always come from hatcheries when you get them in the mail and so on, and there the male chicks that are unwanted are routinely ground up alive or suffocated in bags. It's not like it used to be when those chicks would maybe be raised for meat for a little bit out in the pasture. In the end, all farmed animals go to the same USDA slaughterhouses. 
There's a book called Slaughterhouse by Gail Eisnitz, and she, she did a lot of research and documentation and found that as many as 25% of cows are skinned alive, still moving, because the line speeds are so fast and the stunning with, doesn't always work. You know, it's just, it doesn't go in deep enough or it misses. Likewise, pigs and chickens often scalded alive, conscious, thrashing around. Let's look at the roots of some of this. Historically, when humans first began to dominate animals, that is to say, domesticate them, and, and they began to abuse them, and it opened the dark door also to human slavery and genocide shortly after that. Gavisti, a Sanskrit word for war, means the desire for more cattle. The word capitalism comes from the Latin word capita, as in how many head of cattle do you have? So that you, people started to acquire property and accumulate it and, and be kind of more covetous and greedy. And this led to, you know, more and more like little warlords and kings and, and all that. Our food choices also have huge impacts on a, a, some one billion humans around the world today who are malnourished and starving simply because really they can't afford the grains that are you know, used to feed our animals. And meanwhile, another billion of us are overfed but also malnourished on a rich diet of animal and processed foods, especially, which are un is undermining our health. There's a lot of obesity in the world today, even in places like Mexico where the, the people are desiring this kind of food more and more and getting it. I recommend that you watch this film, What the Health, which is uh, being released in March 2017, and uh, you should be able to see it on Vimeo. It's a follow-up to that great film, Cowspiracy, and it exposes the corruption and collusion in government and big business that, that's really impacting our health and keeping us sick, costing us a lot of money. To step back and look at the big picture, you know, abuse and neglect of both animals and humans, they're related, and both are ultimately a denial of love, aren't they? And also a denial of our connection and our oneness. However, our awareness of the inherent worth and rights of all beings is skyrocketing. I just look at the difference in my own life, you know, in the last decade or two, especially the last couple of years. We may all be on the brink of a new era in our spiritual and cultural evolution. I think that's great. What if the whole world went plant-based? I mean, it's kind of a big goal, but I think it's possible, you know. Um, we could feed 12 to 15 billion people right now on the current farmlands, which means we don't keep increasing our population. We could return a lot of land to nature. Even with an increasing population, it buys us more time to create some solutions. If our pets ate much less meat, then this would just help the whole process all that much more, as we've seen. Due to bioaccumulation of the food chain, we and our pets would also harbor far less toxins. We'd have longer and healthier lives. I'd like to suggest some books here um, that are really inspiring about that. Healthy 100 reviews, some you know four or five little enclaves in the world where people live incredibly healthy lives on mostly plant-based diets and with a nice sense of community. They keep moving. They have a sense of purpose. You know they. They take time to smell the roses and other things also. Uh, how Not to Die is a New York Times bestseller that shows how the top of the top 15 killers of Americans, nearly all of them, um, can be prevented or reversed with a plant-based diet, especially a whole food plant-based diet with like no processed foods like sugar and oil and all that. Blue Zones is similar to Healthy at 100. Very good book, good read. China study is one of the, is the largest nutritional study ever done. 600,000 people in China were, were studied and they found a really high correlation with consumption of meat and various chronic diseases. It's conducted by T. Colin Campbell um, and Thomas Campbell, uh, experts, very great experts in nutrition. They're not to be equated with popular writers who just you know come up with an interesting diet plan that appeals to people's desires. In the pet world, there's plant-based recipes for dogs. It has lots of really tasty, good recipes. Um, you could use it pretty much as she says, or you might want to use the supplements that we recommend in a minute. The little vegan 
dog book. Uh, this book, Bramble, The Dog Who Wanted to Live Forever, doesn't really have recipes, but it's a very inspiring story of, of a dog who was the oldest known dog in the world when she died at age 25. And living on basically the same thing every day, which is, as the author reports, lentils and brown rice, some nutritional yeast, a textured vegetable protein, and um, soy protein, I think, and then uh, lots of garden vegetables. That was about it. So I created a diet kind of similar to that for our book, with her permission. Healthy Happy Pooch is a good one, too. Just a lot of plant-based uh, recipes in there, as well as wisdom of her you know, lifestyle things for a dog's care also. Very good. And a similar book is The Complete Holistic Dog Book, which gives you the option of either um, meat or meatless diets. And the author, Jan Allegretti, is a friend, and she's a hard at work on a great new update to this book. And then, of course, there's our book, this Upstart. <laughs> Only been in print since 1981, in one edition or another. Okay, so here's... Let's go back to the book. Um, the positive, I think, updates in our book. I mean, there's changes in every chapter, but the, particularly in the dietary stuff. So we explore the possibilities, given all these concerns of a new approach. And we kind of, after looking at the problems and the reasons, we explore what's possible, what is healthy, humane, and sustainable for this new era. We found and we shared uh, many stories of both dogs and cats doing not only as well, but often even better on both fresh and packaged, well-planned vegan or plant-based diets. So um, one place you can look to kind of confirm that is you can just go look at you know some of the vegan pet foods we will mention here. Go look at the reviews on Amazon. See the experiences that people have had on, you know, search 100 vegan dogs thriving on gentleworld.com for a lot of really neat, inspiring stories about dogs that are thriving. Uh, it's commonly reported that skin allergies and eye and ear issues clear up. And that's not surprising because two of the top, well, two of the top 10 um, dog and cat food sensitivities are to wheat and soy. Eight of them are to meat, fish, and dairy. We found in our practice that, you know, like a dog might start out, like, say, allergic to beef and then would clear up, you know, if you put it on lamb or something, but now, you know, like lamb and, and rabbit and these other kind of more once exotic meats are are now on the allergen list. And, you know, so pretty soon I'm sure kangaroo and buffalo will be there too. Improved energy and coat okay, is part of that. Better behavior and, like I said, longer lives for many of them. The general scuttlebutt, and when we talked with people who've been trying this for some decades, is it appears to work for about 100% of dogs and two-thirds to maybe as many as 80% of cats, and people are kind of working on that to try to perfect the cat thing. So given all these toxic, eco, and humane issues, we recommend that people give it a try, you know, for at least a month. Evaluate the results. You can get a veterinarian to help you. Um, now, do note that some cats will develop urinary crystals on low meat, no beet diets, basically because it's very alkalizing. And there's things you can do to adjust that and acidify the urine. There's risk factors. Uh, you know, we'll see, you look at Chapter 7 for details and protocol about that. Increase the moisture. Now let's dive right into the recipes that we've created for you in our new edition. These will, you'll find are simpler, they're tasty, you can eat them yourself. <laughs> so first of all, we have a lot of vegan options, palatable, um, tasty recipes with things like organic tofu, beans, lentils, seeds, sometimes textured soy protein for that chewiness, or vital wheat gluten, don't have to use those. Um, they're all carefully analyzed to meet American Association of Feed Control officials' standards. Lentil stew here is a simple, affordable recipe. This is based on that, that dog, Ramble, that lived to age 25, pretty much what she ate every day, similar. Savory stew is another uh, similar recipe, but more tomatoey and more yummy, I think, and people-friendly. Malibu stew is a beautiful mix developed in collaboration with Sheena Deguchi, who flew out from New York City uh, she, to talk with us about that and collaborate, and she has it now in her Malibu dog kitchen there in New York City. If you happen to live around there, you can get it ready-made. 
that's an increasing trend we're going to see, I think, is local fresh food vegan options for, for animals. Here's a really simple one, wild tofu, quick and easy. You just take some tofu, mash, mash it with some nutritional yeast, pour a little bit more on top, put some veggie cat on it, maybe some, you know, baby food pumpkin or things like that your cat might like. Uh, we name it that because it's, it, it was discovered, I should say, by Dr. Tanya Holanko, a friend, her cats love it. And um, it's named that because its protein and fat levels actually compare very favorably to the wild feline diet. Now, they're also, we find in tofu, the levels of fat and protein are pretty similar, and that studies have been finding that that's what's most palatable to cats, is kind of equal levels of fat and protein, almost regardless of what the food is. Here's another one, uh, dog garbanzos. It's shared by CompassionCircle.com. There's a lot of collaboration in this edition. They're the makers of veggie dog and veggie cat supplements, uh, which we're recommending. It's a favorite of Jasmine Rose, a happy, beautiful dog that's the who lives with uh, vegan pet food pioneer James Peden, who founded Veggie Pep. Many dogs and cats like garbanzos, um, they're, and they're higher in fat than many legumes. You, it's, you want to mash them. I mean, the way it's shown in the picture isn't exactly the way you'd feed it. You, you tend to you want to break it up and you know cook them really well to help them digest. We also have um, some what we call pets plus people recipes. This makes your life easier. So you can fix some uh, tasty high protein recipes like like a, kind of a tofu meatloaf or you know burger kind of things that make a nice entree for you. You know, add a salad or you know side vegetable or whatever, and then you know feed it as a primary food for your dog or cat. And with all these foods, we're recommending new supplements. This replaces our old healthy powder. I mean, you can still use the old recipes. That's fine. But use the, kind of use the supplements to go with those recipes and don't, you know, try to mix and match so much. Uh, these veggie pet supplements work with all our new recipes, whether they're the vegan ones or we have, still have some with meat, if you want to do that or feel you need to do it or have some great source of it. So all these veggie pet supplements have been around since the 1980s. But with a new company, CompassionCircle.com, where they can, you can buy them, bought them a couple years ago. They've been updating them, and we collaborated together uh, as they went and worked them to see how they fit with their new recipes. And we checked them out with our new recipes, and we made them together. They made them you know, with, from good sources of materials to be just enough to meet current official standards for dogs or cats per 1,000 calories. And uh, it was an interesting process. Some new amino acids and things were added to kind of, which, I, you know, there may, I think we might be seeing even better um, benefits for vegan dogs and cats using these, you know, as in the years to come. Time will tell. Now, a warning with cats on a home prepared vegan diet, you must use their supplement. That's the only one we know a veggie cat for maintenance or veggie kit for growth, like, you know, for moms. Queens are for kittens. Or Veggie Cat 5, which is for more urinary issues. They can help guide you also on this. It's sunk in our book. Um, that ensures vital nutrients that cats just can't make because they're such obligate carnivores in a sense. From plant foods, you know, preformed vitamin A, B12, rachidonic acid, taurine, and, and so on. It also has some other things in there that are important to, to meet all the AFCO standards. Now, dogs, it seems like people can kind of get away without a lot of supplements, but it's not really recommended. And But if you can't, you don't want to use veggie dog or veggie pup, um, there's some substitutes you can do, and we, we show them in the book, like animal essentials, calcium, human multiples, and so on, proportionalized. Another new thing. We have a very complete nutrient analysis this time uh, using online programs, uh, like this one here at Nutrition Data dot self dot com we were able to really you know analyze all the details that includes um, you know the per percentages of protein fat carbohydrates and all that but also um, the amino acids we were able to see and under protein here there on the right you can also we it doesn't show it here but we looked at you know all the amino acids you can see the different vitamins you know the uh, minerals and so forth so we even the fatty acids we put all that information into a spreadsheet program and calculated it out per 1,000 calories and then compared it to the dog and cat standards from AFCO. And then using 
all these recipes in our book. We also kind of looked at which ones had more fiber, more you know, lower protein, higher protein, this and that. And we, we coded them so you can use them like prescription diets, the ones that, that fit best for weight loss, allergies, diabetes, growth, and kidney disease. So that's kind of a useful thing. You can uh, download it, this chart online, which is just a two-page thing. It's, it's useful to use um, either in the clinic or at home. And the way to download that actually is to go to Susan Pitcairn Diet Handouts. Just search those terms and you'll see a lot of handouts that I've created for your use. Also, what's new? Instead of just, you know, these exacting recipes, I know I'm a little bit compulsive about that, I guess. You know, I want to make sure that that you know you don't have deficiencies and stuff for your animals doing these programs well but other people are more relaxed about it and they make it a little easier and then so for example d blanco a veterinarian friend in santa fe has created a program which we've called dog day and she shared it so it's um basically a hot cereal breakfast that you can enjoy um and your you know your dog can have and then for dinner you just feed them that raw vegetable meat diet or one of our high protein recipes uh, vegan recipes even so this really cuts down on meat you know or, or eliminates it still and makes a kind of something some simple routine thing Cat, dogs like the cereal cat day is a similar uh, way in which you can use maybe one of the high protein uh, vegan cat foods or or a recipe for breakfast maybe and maybe the raw meat thing for dinner or mix them Another program that's flexible and broad is Fresh and Flexible. Jan Allegretti, our friend who wrote the Complete Holistic Dog Book, shared this generously. And it's based on percentages of pro protein-heavy foods and carb-heavy foods, fats, and so on, and plus some fresh fruits and veggies. It's a kind of relaxed way of using the foods that you fix for yourself, just using higher levels of legumes, and then you know maybe supplements and things like that, especially for cats. And yes... Even packaged foods. <laughs> we used to be kind of against packaged foods. And we understand, you know, that's it's much easier for a lot of people. And, you know, the vegan kibbles get some really good reviews. And they're free of all this, you know, bad stuff that's in most grocery store brands. So we think they're a good option also. Especially for, for your convenience, for travel, for backups, for treats. <laughs> um, it's better to supplement with fresh foods. But we're cautioning you... Since the protein levels at minimal levels, you want to make you don't want to dilute it by just adding a lot of high calorie but low protein things like you know fruit or root vegetables or whatever. That's fine for us because we need very little protein, only five to seven percent of calories. But they need more, so so you'd want to use like tofu, legumes, nutritional yeast, eggs, mushrooms, meat, things like that that are high protein kind of when you're just supplementing. It's best really just to alternate those packaged foods with a complete balanced, you know, recipe or program or mix them. Here are some of the packaged foods that are available. V-Dog's a really nice brand. It's um, produced by an all-vegan company. It has high quality products. Their website's very informative about um, different examples of, of dogs that's, that are doing very well on it and how they've actually helped with joint and arthritis and you know skin problems and things like that go go read it check it out it's good and it's tasty i've tried the tasting it myself it's it's fine it's based i think largely on like pea protein and brown rice and other things and they as they point out dogs are evolving along with their human caregivers and that is true i mean dogs are they have developed uh, far more amylase making genes than wolves had and they they really have been eating starches for a long time primarily so um, another nice brand is a little more affordable is Natural Balance Vegetarian Dry Dog Formula. You can get it online at Amazon with uh, free shipping. The uh, V Dog, I should say, you can get. I think you can get it on Amazon too, but it's it's cheaper. They give you free shipping more if you get it direct. Um, cats seem to like. There's several brands available. You know, Evolution is one of them, and um, Benevo and so on. Uh, we're we're finding a lot of cats, so you know maybe their palatability might be a little bit higher for Ami Cat, which is kind of more corn gluten based. Uh, but you know try different ones and see. And it's you know it's a valid thing to just you know to kind of mix it 50-50 with a raw diet. 
Um, if that's you know the best that you can do, that's that's fine. Now, if you Google uh, Susan Pitt Karen Diet Handouts, you can find a postcard here that you feel free to reproduce. And you can go to Vista Print, and it, it should be used can be used for their uh, their websites postcard programs. And um, if you're like a you know veterinarian, want to pass them out. This includes the the basic lentil stew that um, was used for Bramble, the world's oldest dog once upon a time. Tofu meatloaf, very tasty and palatable for both dogs and people. V burger, so a nice dog burger that you can use for, with the works yourself as a hamburger. Fresh and flexible, Jan Allegretti's program in summary. And the wild tofu, a nice thing for cats. This is another handout, Healthy Plant-Based Meals for Dogs, which uh, goes through the details of these recipes, some of the ones I just mentioned, and also savory stew. Here's another handout. Uh, this one has Jan Allegretti's proportional program, Fresh and Flexible. On the back side uh, are some recipes from Compassion Circle, recommended commercial vegan pet foods and supplements and treats, books, websites. Very informative. How about you? Okay, well here's a two-page handout for you. This is pretty much what we eat most of the time. And it gives, on the left there, on that yellow block, there's um, basically you want to fill about half your plate up with produce, with fruits and vegetables. And the other half, make sure you get plenty of starchy foods, you know, whole grains, potatoes, yams, and squash, and legumes. Peas, lentils, beans, hummus, tofu, tempeh. And, you know, if you're not thriving on a vegan diet, it's probably because you're not following those proportions or eating enough food. Uh, and then it gives some advice also for, you know, just having a little bit of nuts and seeds every day um, and for your omega-3s. And, and be sure to take vitamin B12. If you take nothing else, take B12. We ourselves take a Dr. Fearman's supplements, uh, which contain other things that are, that are helpful. And um, you can see a little note on that there, like iodine and D3. And we sometimes take uh, omega-3, which is a, an algae-based DHA EPA capsule. So here you have breakfast, salads, sandwiches. Oh man, this this has replaced all the cheese sandwiches we used to eat. And <laughs> I don't think was so good for our health really. And then various entrees, sauces, you know, cheesy kind of sauce substitutes and gravies and uh, sour cream kind of things you can make really easily. And uh, you can also buy you know a lot of these foods in the market. But this is more affordable and I think generally a little healthier because we're using whole foods. In chapter five, we address some of the common questions. Like, isn't it unnatural and even cruel to feed dogs and cats a vegan? I mean, you know, they're obviously predators. Well, but you know, think what else is unnatural? You know, tuna for cats, milk from cows, beef, you know, for a little chihuahua, living indoors, being confined, being trained. The fact is animals do adapt and evolve and they have developed uh, amylase-making genes to, to digest our starches and did that a long time ago when wolves became ancestral dogs. So if they can do okay on these diets when the proof's in the pudding, are their preferences, even if they might prefer meat, more important than the huge amount of suffering entailed on far more animals? If we're going to talk cruelty, let's talk about that. How about Aren't grains bad for them? There's all these, you know, grain-free pet foods, right? Well, many DVMs think that anti-grain trends are just marketing hype. You know, it's probably started with the China pet food scare and, you know, somewhat with the raw food diet. Um, and, and not really from coming from the profession. Uh, as we've been saying, early dogs developed extra genes, and they actually make about 20 times more amylase than wolves do. And amylase is used to digest, digest starch. It's carbohydrates. We also actually are different from chimpanzees uh, in that way. And those of us humans who have come from farmer ancestors maybe make as much as five times more amylase than uh, those that, like maybe the Inuit, who come really from true hunter-gatherers who had no other choice due to the extreme climates they lived in. If you look at Wikipedia, dog food history, you can find interesting references to how dogs were fed, recommended to be fed mostly things like 
bread and whey or barley and beans and so on. Victorian cats had porridge for breakfast and meat for dinner. Okay, a lot of people ask about wheat and soy allergies. It's true, both are in the top 10 food pet allergens. But, you know, they don't really compare the organic and the glyphosate versions, right? Um, and, and all the rest of the allergies are to meat, dairy, and seafood. So we suggest either you try the organic versions of soy and wheat or use recipes denoted on the chart with A, which is the allergen-free one, so they have no soy and wheat. What about protein? How do you get enough protein? <laughs> Common question. Well, you know, for for humans, it's a it's a no-brainer. We we only need you know maybe five percent of our diet to be protein by by calories, um, and we so we have a chart that shows a list of foods in protein order of levels of protein per calorie. Tofu, it turns out, is higher than most meats, which are primarily fat. Uh, lentils, kidney beans, mushrooms, nutritional yeast are higher actually than hamburger or chicken with skin. And also with less fat to sort of dilute them, less of these empty calories, plant foods are, are actually higher in vitamins and minerals by and large than animal foods. We also list which foods to use and kind of describe how to cook them and you know just things about them and foods to avoid including things like onions, grapes, and chocolate. We also recommend like things like using an instant pot makes it really easy to eat, to cook bulk beans and you, know, you can save money on this this diet for yourself and for your animal. All right, let's say you're a veterinarian or someone who advocates for animals, or maybe a, a a breeder or a, you know, uh, just a someone who loves animals and wants to share about it. How do you help other people get past this, you know, idea, especially the raw feeders who are going to say, oh, this can't work, you know, how, why does it doesn't make any sense, it's counterintuitive. Well, you might open the conversation on a plant-based diet by posting literature signs, you know, offer it as an option to be considered for allergies, skin issues, heavy metal toxicity signs, and which can be tested. You can test mercury pretty cheaply. I suggest it as a trial for a month or two, or just cut down on meat, and you can monitor it. And you can always go back, maybe document it with labs, see the, the before and after results. Uh, and you know, try it yourself. Share from your experience. You know, many people you might say something like, you know, many people find it works just fine, and even helps their animals. Um, it's worth a try. You know, I eat this way. I feed animals the same. We're we're doing fine. You know, reassure them. And um, Regarding our book, you might point out the, the we, the pit carrots, were actually among the first people to recommend raw meat in home diets. And now we're making a change for important health, humane, and eco reasons. Maybe we're worth listening to. You know, and it's based on decades of success from vegan pet food pioneers. And that's pretty much what we have done. We've often, you know, uh, just reported what other people have been doing. And that's kind of what we did from the very beginning. You know, we didn't we're not the first ones to come up with all this stuff exactly, but we're the first ones maybe to really often popularize it. So also, you know, it really feels good to live in alignment with your values, which I'm sure that you have if you're watching this, of love and compassion for all animals. You know, and it helps to get in touch with some of these farmed animals. Maybe visit a sanctuary, farm sanctuary, or if you're a veterinarian, maybe give a talk at one. And it's helpful, everybody who writes supportive blogs, Facebook posts, you know, journal you know, articles, and that kind of thing, and, and help to assure the raw feeders about successes and how many veterinarians are coming along and endorsing that. At our last uh, annual meeting of, of veterinarians and kind of a group that we know, there's, there are 40 people there, and I'd say 30 to 35 of them said they've been experimenting with this and finding it good you know, for themselves and for their animals. So... Um, you know, you can recommend websites, information, films, books, I and mean, get the information out there. If people are resistant, if you're resistant, you know, it's, it's, we're not pushing this. You know, we understand, you know, we've been there, you know, just, and we, we're trying to just model confidence. I mean, we don't need people to agree with us. Uh, now, the other thing that's helpful for anyone that's trying to do this, and that we, it helps us, is to know, you know, you're not alone. You're part of an evolutionary shift, 
And I, we believe because of that, life has our backs. You know, it brings people our way. It opens doors. There's these synchronicities and so on. Even if it sometimes looks otherwise. The vegan movement is a really a very positive force for global change. In fact, could plant-based diets become the new normal? According to Gary Franzioni, he's done the numbers. He's a, a Rutgers University law professor. If each American vegan, which is over 3 million, convinced just one person a year to shift their diet, and that person did the same as well, okay, the whole country would be plant-based in less than a decade. Run the numbers. It's pretty amazing. Let's, as Cop Captain Picard says, let's make it so. I think the power of intention is really important. It's different than hope or fear. It's just like coming from that place inside yourself that kind of contributes to, at some level, to creating our reality. Just make it so. Just intend it. Thank you for watching this. Thank you for your caring. Uh, here's our one of our adopted daughters, <laughs> Carolyn Benson, a veterinarian for Ontario, from Ontario, who's just gotten so on board with this and so happy about it. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for all the veterinarians and animal lovers who are supporting this. Thank you.